Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Cohere for AI Fireside Chats. This is episode two featuring Pablo Samuel Castro. We are delighted to have you join us today. I'm going to let a few people trickle in. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Before we get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are. If you haven't heard of Cohere for AI, or this is your first time participating in one of our events, welcome. Uh, we are a nonprofit research lab, and we're a community dedicated to contributing fundamental research in machine learning, and we're working to solve some of the field's most challenging problems. Our programs include supporting community-driven research, and this is across fundamental machine learning topics. Uh, we have the C for AI Scholars Program, our full-time research positions in lab, and our Fireside Chats speaker series, which I am delighted to be uh, setting up today. Our mission at Cohere for AI is changing where, how, and by whom research is done. We feel very strongly about this, uh, and events like our Fireside Chats help to achieve that mission. And welcome again. Lots of speaker series focus on research. Ours focuses on people. Uh, Cohere for AI fireside chats bring together leading researchers and rising stars in the field of machine learning. And they're all here to discuss their research learning journeys. Uh, we believe that research is inherently a human endeavor. And this discussion series provides insights from beginning to breakthrough. So before I turn it over, I'm gonna mention a couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording this event, so you'll be able to catch the replay on our YouTube channel in a couple days once we repost. And we will have a question and answer period after Sarah has had her chance to have a wonderful chat here. And if you wish to ask questions, use the question and answer function. There's a little button. You can submit your questions anonymously or with your name, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for today's event. So please take it away. Everybody, please enjoy. Thanks, Ali. That was a really nice uh, overview of uh, the different programs that we're doing. I'm really excited to be here with Pablo today. Ellie's right. Please keep the questions coming. So we'll open up. Uh, I think Ellie was saying after my discussion. So after I throw a lot of questions, hopefully some like easy ones and some more hard ones to get everyone thinking, feel free to chime in on the FAQ. So I'm going to uh, do my best to introduce Pablo, but I feel like I'm undoubtedly going to miss some things because in some ways Pablo is so multifaceted and has so many interesting pursuits and hobbies and expertise, but um, Pablo was born in Quito, Ecuador and moved to Montreal after high school to study at McGill. He did his PhD focusing on reinforcement learning under the supervision of Doina and Prakash, uh, Pablo has worked at Google since 2012 and is currently a staff research software developer in Google Brain in Montreal and is focused on fundamental machine learning problems. Uh, he's a regular advocate for Latinx um, and is also an active musician and marathon, six-time marathon runner. <laughs> I'm not sure if that count is up to date. I pulled that from your website, but still very impressive. Um, but Pablo is also a very, I consider a very good friend and to, we have worked together on several different initiatives. So it's really a pleasure to have you here and to talk um, about both things that I've known about you, but also many things that I've ended up discovering and thinking about this panel. So I think this will be fun. Um, I wanted to kick off because you and I were actually in Quito a few weeks ago. So Pablo was organizing RIA, which is this conference that was in Ecuador in Quito for the first time. And it was interesting when I arrived, it was fascinating because there's been a whole new airport built outside of Quito because the old airport, Quito is so elevated, it's so high that the old airport, there would be all these plane crashes of people <laughs> trying to land in this like fairly mountainous area. And I remember when I went downstairs the first day, you're like, don't exercise. The altitude's so crazy. You're going to feel <laughs> it's going to really hit you. So you grew up in this really unique and beautiful place in the world, which is just so it, it, it it's um, I, I remember walking through Quito and the day you took us around. It's both so beautiful and also in some ways so different from many of the traditional routes into our field. Um, what was your childhood like? 
Thank you, Sarah, first of all, for, for inviting me. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I also consider you such a great friend and uh, it's, it's really nice to be able to chat about this. Um, yeah, so Quito is a beautiful city. I, I love that city. Um, it uh, a, a, was an interesting place to grow up in. Obviously, when you're growing up, uh, that's all you know. So it's kind of like, this is how everybody grows up. Um, and it was really only when I came to Canada that I guess you realize, oh, I guess, that is a different way of growing up than, than other people. Um, I think, I mean, I was fortunate in that uh, growing up, um, you know, my parents had, had means, so I had like a good education. Um, I wasn't in want of like health or, or, or nutrition or anything like that. Like I had a, a comfortable uh, upbringing in, in that sense. And having access to, to that education, I think, is, is definitely a privilege I had that lots of people in my country don't have. Um, so I actually, so from when I was four until I was eight, we actually lived in Miami for my dad's job. So I had um, sort of an American uh, upbringing in those early years. And that's where I, I learned English. Um, and then we lived in Puerto Rico, actually, for a year and a half. And so I had like a, a kind of U.S.-centric upbringing up to almost 10 years old. So, so this affected me in terms of culture, like the movies that I ended up liking, the, the type of humor that, that I appreciated. And I brought that back to Ecuador and that, um, the school I was in had a lot of people uh, from abroad, so a lot of international students. And so I ended up uh, connecting with them a lot because of that, that cultural background. Um, but being in Ecuador, I think um, initially it was almost like I was a foreigner because I spoke English better than I spoke Spanish and, and like my, you know, what I had grown up with up to that point was very different from what my classmates had, had been growing up with. So it was a little bit of an adaptation process, but then, um, you know, I sort of tried to, not, not explicitly, but I guess uh, subconsciously sort of merge the two cultures uh, in, a, in a way that, that made sense. Um, but I, I guess what you were getting at is it's not a traditional way to come into AI research. And I agree, it's not. Um, I always liked computers. Uh, when we first got a computer, I think I was in um, sixth grade, maybe, or something like that. And this was really like early days when computers weren't that uh, prevalent. But I loved them. I, I fell in love with them. And I knew I wanted to do something with computers. I didn't know that it was called computer science. Um, and when I was applying to university, I didn't know what to look for. and uh, I guess it wasn't such a big field that they didn't, I wasn't, I didn't get the guidance in, in high school. So I applied to management actually, because my dad is very much in, in that space. So he suggested management, there was an information systems degree. Um, and that's where I started off at McGill uh, and quickly realized that this is not what I, <laughs> what I wanted. And so being in that new space, I learned about computer science and that's when I switched over. Yeah, it's really interesting. It resonates for me, this idea of um, if you have been to different places, there's almost this feeling of transience where you have different things that inform you from different places. And at some point you have to reconcile like there, there's, there's multiple facets of yourself that become your identity over different times. So that's interesting. Absolutely. And I mean, you, you've lived in a bunch of different places as well. So you, you must know what, what this is like. And even like beyond uh, upbringing, like I feel the person I was when I left Ecuador and the person even after finishing undergrad after four years uh, were, even though they were the same person, like a lot of the, the views and, and uh, kind of what's important in life and, and positions on certain things, whether they be political or um, uh, religious or anything like that, changed quite a lot. So, so those different experiences definitely end up changing who you become and uh, yeah. Uh, there's still connections to the past, but also um, new connections that, that you start forging. What do you think it is about your undergraduate in particular that allowed you to revise all these different beliefs or things? I remember you told me when we were in, in Quito, they used to, you grew up very religious. And I think part of mm -hmm. the, your un, was it in your undergraduate that you started to like explore or, or question? Not so much. So I was still pretty religious throughout my undergrad. Um, I was still quite religious until close to my 30s, I'd say. Um, so I grew up, Ecuador is a very Catholic country and most people grow up very religious. My parents are still very, very religious. Um, but then closer to my 30s, I don't know if you remember, there was a big scandal with um, uh, many priests that, that were accused of pedophilia and 
I felt that the um, the church was not really responding in a way that uh, I felt they should have because it was kind of uh, in, uh, uncontestable the the accusations that were that were being brought forward. Um, there's enough evidence for them, so that I, I just found um, unjustifiable, and and that. Uh, pushed me away from the church. So I, I left the church at that point. And only at that point did I start really questioning uh, my own beliefs and, and things like that. And so I started actually, I read the whole Bible from <laughs> start to finish um, after doing that, because I said, if I, if I really want to understand my, my belief system and where I stand, um, I feel like I have to take an informed decision. So I, I read that. I, I read a whole bunch of other books uh, i read you know dawkins god delusion i even like some india from from india like uh, uh vedantic texts and things like that which is more about spirituality and things like that um and really just to open my mind to exploring things a bit i allowed myself to explore things a bit more whereas previously i hadn't i sort of kept that door closed because i was maybe i was a little afraid of what i would answer myself and and yeah, the outcome of that was that uh, I and came out totally atheist at the end. <laughs> um, <that> was, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, my parents are, are very religious, um, and I totally respect that, and I think it brings them a lot of peace. Um, and I think there's a lot of good that comes from that. Like they're they're very active in their communities, and they actually are proactive in, in trying to help people, for instance, in their marriages and things like that. There's obviously things I don't uh, totally agree with them, and and there are issues where. We don't stand on the same ground, but I think in general, um, like the values that that come from being brought, having been brought up in that culture um, of just you know trying to be a good person and trying to do good for others, not just for yourself. I think I still carry those, and my parents recognize that, and so I think they've come to terms with the fact that um, even though I'm not part of the, their church anymore, that that is, we still share a lot of the same values. Yeah, it's really interesting. I feel like this idea of um, questioning your own beliefs and stress testing your assumptions, in some ways, it's so related to this idea of the pursuit of knowledge and trying to understand where you understand, where you stand on different um, fields, and even the pursuit of science. I find that um, it very much relates to our own curiosity about the world and just constantly reassessing where we are. Um, I want to ask, like, what was, so you picked up from America and Puerto Rico, a sense of humor, <laughs> uh, and then you go to Canada for your undergraduate um, in business, and then you decided not for you. What was the next step and uh, how, um, it, what was your first, uh, what was the available compute when, we, when, you, when you first started exploring computer science? It sounds like you already had your first computer. What were you using it for at the time? So when I started with computers, at first, um, we had uh, one of the first games I remember. I mean, games, obviously, is a thing that kids are always drawn to. Um, but they were very text-based games. I mean, before having the first computer, I had uh, the Commodore 64. <laughs> which was this console. It was just like a keyboard that you hooked up to your TV and it was all text-based games. Um, it's really cool. Uh, I, I love that. Um, but then the, the computer with a monitor, I think it was the first one I had was a, a, a Apple Apple IIe, um, which was black and white screen. I think that was the one. Uh, and, and so one game I remember we had there was Carmen San Diego. And I just love the interaction uh, like, uh, that the, the computer could respond to your inputs and um, I just found that fascinating and when I discovered that you could actually do make some of those things yourself um, it was really eye-opener for me and, and I, that I think was what drew me to that because I've always been drawn to creating things um, like I remember uh, growing up some of my friends had Dungeons and Dragons and so they had these these bo big books and you couldn't get those in Ecuador um, and so I played with with at my friend's house because he had the books and he had the the you know the die with all the twenty sided die and eight sided die and all these things, um, and I wanted to play it. I wanted to play with my with my brother and some other friends, but I didn't have the books. So, so one summer I made uh, all the die out of wax, <laughs> so I spent all night just like melting candles and, and making the die. They obviously didn't work super well because they're not totally regular, but I, I sort of made my own thing, um, and that's I think something that I've always had. Uh, throughout my life is that I like making things and, and computers I felt 
was one tool where you could make things that um, could look very polished and could also uh, have other people interact with uh, in, in a hopefully meaningful way. So one of the first things I used to do was, um, this was called, uh, so now I think it's Adobe uh, Flash, uh, but it used to be Macromedia Flash where you could, um, basically you had a timeline and you could make keyframes where you draw like a little spaceship moving around. So you can make animations, but you can also add like logic controls. So if the user presses up, then the spaceship goes up and things like that. So kind of like a game, like a, a, a very primitive game, but um, the ability to be able to do that was just so cool to me. And that's that's really what drew me to, to, to wanting to do things with computers and, and information systems and management was not that. <laughs> And then I discovered that computer science was where you learned how to do like code, uh, how to write code and, and make these things that um, people could use with computers. And how was your transition between the two degrees? And afterwards, I, uh, I seem to recall you started at Google straight after you graduated your undergraduate, right? No, no. Um, so I, I moved pretty quickly to computer science. So I think I did three weeks in management and Oh, okay. No yeah. <laughs> That's so funny, Pablo. So basically, yeah. immediately, you're like, no. <laughs> yeah, well, so I, I joined, and uh, there was one computer course, and it was basically how to use Excel formulas and things like that. I was like, what? This is not, like, I know how to do this. How is this, uh, like, university level degrees? And the math as well, we had to take a math course, and it was pretty basic. Uh, and I was already, like, more advanced in math, and I just couldn't understand that this was university in Canada um, and I was coming from Ecuador and how is this like, how am I learning things that I already know? So I went, I asked around and they were like, oh no, no, computer science is what you need. And of course, when I switched there, it was like, okay, this is really hard, and, <laughs> but, but exciting and fun and, and uh, yeah. So after finishing undergrad, um, uh, I found a job with CAE. Uh, it's a company in Montreal that makes builds flight simulators for for training ah, pilots yes so they have, they're like that. actual physical things that um it's really cool because you when you go in one of these things the, the cockpit looks exactly like an airplane cockpit cockpit and so acceleration they use gravity to simulate acceleration so you know when the plane is taking off that you get pulled back in your seat because you're in this closed space and you see these in, in you know um in science museums and things like that where you you kind of go through the human body and you feel like you're moving through the human body. It's just using gravity for to simulate acceleration. Uh, and so I was working uh, in code uh, for, for those simulators. Um, and I did that for four years after my undergrad. Yeah, it's actually really a cool job. Yeah, it's interesting because it's one of the most, it seems to be one of the most viable, like immediate applications of VR because it's like training programs for pilots still where there's a lot of interest mm -hmm. in how can we actually improve the feeling and you can switch out different plane models easily if you can do it properly. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, whether that's feasible right now is a different question, but it yeah. seems interesting for that perspective alone. Like it's a nice controlled setting where you could start to explore some of these dynamics. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was very cool. But then after four years of that, uh, I got the itch to go back to school again. And that's when I went to, to grad school. And how was uh, grad school at the time? So, uh, it, it, what was the well? What was the available compute? And uh, who did you spend your lunch time with? Like, who was your? What was your uh, initial set of interests when you started grad school? And how did that evolve over the course of grad school? So. I had done my. I did my undergrad, my master's, and my PhD all at McGill which is not really the recommended route, but uh, for personal reasons, um, like I had a girlfriend who's now my wife uh, at the time, so I didn't want to leave Montreal. I also had a band uh, in Montreal that things were going pretty well, so I didn't want to leave that. And so we decided to just stay in Montreal and, and, and do uh, my degrees there. Um, and the choice, so the, the funny story is, uh, I almost left computer science um, completely. Uh, as I said, I started getting a niche when I was the four years in CAE and I wanted to a change. And I actually decided um, that I, I've always been a musician and, and I decided I'm going to do another undergrad in, in jazz performance. Um, and I went and I auditioned at McGill. So that McGill has a very good jazz program. And they, they have only like a, a limited number of seats for each uh, instrument. And so for piano, they were auditioning for two piano seats that year. And there were like, I don't know, 100 
people applying. Um, so I didn't make it. I didn't get one of the piano seats. And so um, I said, okay, well, there goes that idea. Uh, and I was just going to stay working at CAE. But around the same time, I ran into Doina, who I had taken AI with in, in undergrad. And I really liked AI. Um, and I just ran into her in the street. And we were just chit-chatting. And I was telling her, oh, yeah, I applied to music and didn't get in. Um, and she's like, why don't you come do a master's with me? And that was really the first time I, I thought of grad school in CS. I hadn't, it wasn't really something I had considered that uh, at, at all. Um, and so she planted the seed in me. And so I went to talk with her and Prakash had been also my, my prof in undergrad. And I really liked his way of teaching. And I just felt he had a lot to, to teach. Uh, like he knows math really well and he explains it really well. Um, and I liked him, I got along well with him. So I, uh, I found out they were working together. So um, I read like um, the, um, the artificial intelligence um, book, the, uh, Russell and Norvig. Uh, oh, AI yeah. <laughs> so I yeah. read that, the, the earlier, the first version, because yeah. I had it in, in my bookshelf. Um, and I thought evolutionary algorithms were so cool. Like, this is yeah. so neat. And so I went to talk to Dwayne and Prakash. I was like, I want to do this. And Prakash was like, no, nope. <laughs> we're not doing evolutionary <laughs> algorithms. Um, he's like, we're working on this thing uh, called reinforcement learning. If you want to join, um, you can you, you work on this. Um, and because I didn't really have any strong opinions about at that point. Um, so AI was definitely not what it is now. Um, like very few people worked on it at the time. Um, and so, yeah, I accepted uh, to join them to work on <laughs> the stuff they were working on, which uh, ended up being RL. And I, I really liked it, luckily. And, and so that's why I stayed to do the PhD after as well. It's so funny because I was looking through the blog posts on your website. So everyone should go check out Pablo's website. He has these really fun blog posts and there's this miscellaneous section. There's actually a blog post there on evolutionary algorithms <laughs> where you're doing some simulations. So you did preserve at least like a kernel of your interest through the... So I, I think they're fascinating yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, from a, I think from a creativity perspective, uh, yeah. they, they can offer so much. Like one... Um, piece of software that I love is the Lenya uh, that's that's based oh, on the yeah. game of life yeah um, and it creates these like artificial life forms uh, and uh, the, the creator is at, is at Google now I actually met him two weeks ago um, and I just find it so cool because it there's a uh, there's a lot of beauty that I feel like that comes out of that and it comes from these um, programmatic rules uh, that are when they interact in, in these uh, complex ways, they, they produce these unpredictable things that, that, that are very uh, beautiful, I find. Um, and from that perspective, I, I really uh, I really like them. From a research side, um, Matt Prakash is very much into the math. And so proving things about uh, these evolutionary algorithms is, is, is really hard. And so I think that's why he's not that interested in them. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as a last aside about evolutionary algorithms, I think I was sold on the beauty when there was this documentary about Pixar back in the day when it was first starting and they had these fractals, evolutionary uh, kind of programmatic design where a lot of their um, actual landscapes at the time were based on evolutionary algorithms, like just starting with a fractal type pattern and allowing it to evolve. And it is crazy if you look up Pixar, Fractals, or some combination. This is brilliant video, which goes into it, but. Oh, cool. um, yeah, um, well, let me ask. Um, so I think what is most interesting is that um, similar to myself, you have actually worked in both applied settings as well as research settings. So it's really interesting. I feel like it's a very, um, very different from a lot of academic journeys, which essentially go through the entire um, uh, career trajectory within an academic space. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So how did you end up working in an applied um, research study? I mean, the problems sounded still very interesting, but what was that trajectory for you after your PhD? So I, I, I mean, when I was doing my PhD, I, I discovered that I really like research and that's actually what I wanted to do. And I wanted to be a prof. I wanted to go through the whole academic route. Um, as I said, the, at the time, AI isn't what it is now. So the job opportunities were much fewer than, than, than what we have now. Um, the other thing is, as I said, I, I did my three degrees in the same place, which is not great. I was also working in mostly theoretical stuff. And so uh, I really only interacted with my two supervisors. And so when I was 
starting to think about jobs and, and thinking where I could apply, for most places you need at least three academic references. And I had two, maybe three, all from McGill. Um, and so that that proved difficult. That was uh, something I, I didn't, you know, didn't anticipate. Um, and so I had a really hard time uh, finding even interviews. Like I just wasn't being called for interviews. I found a postdoc. Uh, they just wanted a machine learning person uh, and not, not really, uh, it didn't matter what I had focused on as long as I knew uh, machine learning. Um, and it was in Paris, which was, was a draw. So I ended up getting that offer. And so we went to Paris. But at the same time, I got the job off from Google because um, Doina actually told me you should apply to Google. I hear it's, it's a great place to work. Um, and I was like, all right, fine, I'll apply. Because <laughs> I really was, was set on being a prof. Uh, and, and so I applied to Google. Um, luckily, I, I got the job, but I told them I wanted to wait a year because I wanted to try out the postdoc and see if I could do this academic route. And I think it was a good decision because the postdoc itself wasn't great. Like um, Paris was amazing. I love living in Paris, but the postdoc wasn't quite what I was looking for. Uh, it wasn't the research I wanted to do. Um, I kind of felt that uh, there was a bit too much emphasis on on H indexing and things like that. So uh, with the impact factor of the papers you will produce, as opposed to um, what you get out of the, out of the research. Um, and so then I realized, you know, this might be, if I wa really want this academic career, it might be I do a postdoc here and then I have to do another postdoc somewhere else. And then maybe I'll get an assistant prof in some small town somewhere um, until I can find another system prof in maybe a better town and then finally, hopefully find a tenure track somewhere. And I already had two young kids. And so the prospect of moving around so much um, just didn't seem that that good. So I uh, joined Google at that point. And so this was a, a pure software engineering in machine learning, like applied machine learning for ads, but very software engineering uh, focused. So at that point I said goodbye to research. Like I said, okay, I'm done with research. Uh, I assumed I would never read a research paper again. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, I really grew as an engineer there. I really enjoyed my time. It was, uh, challenging and, and fun and had great colleagues. And after we moved back to Montreal, brain opened. Um, and yeah, I was fortunate to, to be able to join again. And that was pretty eye-opening because when I left research, this was uh, 2012. So, you know, uh, this is the ImageNet year, but yeah. I didn't see the ImageNet year. So for me, AI at that point was still like this niche thing that a few of us cared about. And uh, I mean, I, of course, I heard that AI was, was growing, but uh, when I rejoined research and re reinforcement learning in particular, it was like, everybody's using deep nets now? <laughs> like back then we just, you know, dealt with tabular systems and, and proved things. Uh, and now it's like, wow, it's actually like superhuman at Atari and, and things like that. So I had to learn a lot of things um, when, when rejoining yeah. research. I still have this vivid memory of NeurIMS 2017, and it was almost like the, the holes for reinforce, reinforcement learning were literally like overflowing. It was beginning of the chaos years where they would need spillover rooms because the holes would yeah. be so big. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it was, it, it was really surprising to see um, how, how much the field had grown. I mean, exciting, but, but also uh, somewhat daunting at first. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Um, but I think that the, the engineering skills that I accrued throughout those years where I was not in research have been super valuable now because I mean, as, as we know, like machine learning research, engineering is a huge as uh, has a huge role to play in it. And the better engineer you are, the, I think the, the better researcher you'll also be. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that as a discipline, we're so um, the the scale of experiments that we now have to do to execute on certain hypotheses. It's really a strength to be a strong engineer and to be able to iterate end to end on both like mm -hmm. generating idea, but like iterate on it quickly. So yeah, that's yeah. a really interesting. I actually, you know, uh, I have, uh, I was going to ask this later, but let me ask this now because it's kind of related. So almost this I this what you just said is related to this idea of you know people coming into the field what should they focus on and how to build up their strengths in different areas um one thing that's unique about your research trajectory and body of work is that in some ways it covers um various areas reinforcement learning uh music creativity uh just 
you know, fundamental machine learning problems. What advice do you have for um, the pros and cons of specializing versus being able to contribute to various subfields over the course of your career? And what are the, I guess in some ways, um, what are the trade-offs that you've seen as you've thought about your own body of research? Yeah, that's a good and tough question to answer because I feel like the the optimal answer will vary from person to person. I think the the PhD is a is a time in your life if you do it where where you do get to focus on one thing and become a you know a world expert in this one very niche thing um, that few people uh, will have as much expertise as you do. Whether or not it becomes useful later is, is a different story, but I think that the main value of the PhD is to be able to have that time to lead your own project, to sort of carve out your space and, and really become the, the world expert um, where you know not just about the specific thing you're proposing, but all the literature around it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's extremely useful. Um, and, and that, I don't think is necessarily for everybody. So uh, you must get this question a lot. Uh, people will, will ask, should I do a PhD? Um, and my answer is always like, do you want to do a PhD? Because it's a long, it's a long process. It's very frustrating. I mean, we know how the whole, we're going through the IQ rebuttals now and it can be very frustrating. Um, you've put so much work into, into you know, a paper and then to have it sort of be dismissed sometimes offhandedly by, by reviewers, it can be frustrating and, and demoralizing. And that, you know, you do it over four to six years. Um, it, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. Um, so I think to do a PhD, you really have to want to do it. And that allows you to specialize uh, that way. Uh, and I think for a PhD, it, it's useful to be able to specialize uh, once you've found like what it is you want, you want to work on. Um, post PhD, or if you don't do a PhD, I think it really depends um, the type of freedom you have in, in what you're working on and how much time you want to devote to things. So um, as I said, when I rejoined research, I had a lot of catch up to do. Uh, so I had the only time I had touched a neural net before then was a neural net that I built for my undergrad um, in C++. Like there weren't, there was no PyTorch, no TensorFlow <laughs> or anything like that. Like I had to code each neuron in, in C++ and, and sort of, uh, compute gradients and, and you know, build wow. this whole system myself. And um, then it was actually for music. It was supposed to learn how to improvise in jazz. <laughs> it didn't work that well, but it was an interesting exercise. So when I joined, everybody was using neural nets and I had no idea how they worked because I'd never really used them. Um, and so at that point, I was really just saying yes to everything. And so, the, you know, the, the, I worked on this project with lyrics, uh, like building a language model for lyrics. Um, and it was at the beginning, I was way over my head um, and I didn't know. I said, sure, I'll do it. I'll do it. I, I know machine learning, <laughs> but I had to, you know, luckily nowadays we have the internet and we can read about lots of things. So I actually found Adri Karpati's uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of, of uh, RNNs or something like that. And so I, I took that code and I started playing with that and trying to get a better sense. Okay, this is how, how these things work. Um, and so I think at that period in time, I was doing a lot of different things um, in a somewhat shallow way, I guess, but just really trying to absorb as much as I, as I could. Um, and so I think that the situation I was in at the time uh, lent itself well to, to that sort of broad exploration. I think now at the point I'm in my career, I'm actually trying to focus a bit more because I feel uh, I'm a bit spread thin um, in, in some of, some of the, the projects, I mean, I, I feel like I, I either have to take a step back and just provide kind of supervisory advice or just, you know, say, I'm sorry, I can't commit to this mm -hmm. as much. So I think it really depends on, on the expectations from the other parties. Um, like at the beginning, I was working on a lot of things, but just on my own. So my only expectations were my, my own, but now that I have people that, that depend on my work. Um, uh, I think it's uh, important to, to make sure that uh, you're not saying yes to everything just because you want to be nice, um, because that has consequences that if you don't, if you aren't able to commit uh, enough time to them, you'll end up uh, stalling projects that, that mean a lot to, a lot of other, uh, other, to other people.
So it's, uh, yeah, sometimes you have to rein in and focus on things, sometimes um, uh, try a lot of things. So that's my non-answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely think there's something to be said for the stages of your arc as a researcher. I, my general mm -hmm. advice to anyone starting out is also that you should focus because I think mm -hmm. commanding, uh, like when you start to try and command in your field, it helps to just zero in and become the expert on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think that's echoed in what you're saying. And there are transition points where you start to sample different subfields and see connections in new ways, which also brings its own, like, uh, I think really interesting arc in your research taste and perspective. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna jump right into another question that's re related. Uh, so how, uh, what was an early paper that you think was very important to your growth as a researcher and why? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, probably the first research paper I read, which was, um, you know, I mentioned this, this talk I had with Doyne and Prakash, and I wanted to do evolutionary algorithms, and they said no. Um, and they gave me a paper that they had recently published with, with their PhD student, Norm Ferns. Um, and this was on by simulation metrics, which ended up being something that I worked on throughout my PhD and I still work on now. Uh, and I remember it was so different from, from anything I had read before, just in the way it was written, um, but it, it uh, combined math, it combined proofs and it combined experiments. Um, and, and that now in retrospect, thinking about it, I, I think it, it opened my eyes a little bit into, you know, all of the things we learn in undergrad where you have these separate things. So you have your linear algebra class and you have your real analysis class and you have your um, compiler design class. Um, and they're all sort of separated, isolated in, in their own uh, time slots. Um, seeing this research paper combine so many of those concepts into one higher level vision, that was really cool for me to see because uh, I, I've mentioned this to, to some people like I, I wish I had paid more, more attention in linear algebra class but I, at the time I, I just the, the prof wasn't that good and, and I didn't really see what the connection was to this, the things I was interested in and I think research papers for me had that um, holistic unifying lens on, on a lot of these these uh, topics that we learn uh, in our in our schooling. So I, I'd say that paper, which was uh, metrics for finite markup decision processes, which is probably one of the papers I say the most. So because a lot of my work still revolves around that. Wow! So it's like carried through <laughs> until today. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to ask. Uh, so many. I think that we were colleagues of Brain. Uh, my understanding is many people would love for you to be a manager of Brain. In fact, I feel like you're constantly asked, Pablo, is it time? Do you want to be a manager now? But you've so far been quite, uh, you've been quite uh, steadfast in your desire that it's not for you. Like, why is that? Um, and how do you think about that perspective, especially given you mentor so many people? Yeah, um, it's, so I've been asked a couple times. One time I said, yes, okay, I'll, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> no, but I, I felt like the team was starting to grow and I did see a need for a manager, um, an extra manager that wasn't, because Hugo was managing, Hugo La Rochelle was managing a lot of people. And so he asked me, could you start managing uh, these people? And I said, yes, because I, I realized that there was a need for that. And so I said, but I, these were all sort of peers. Um, some of them were at my same level. Um, and so I said, I'd like to meet with them first and just make sure that they're okay with, they would be okay with this change and see if they have any suggestions. And I met, started meeting with all of them and they, they were all okay. And then I met with one of them um, and just chatting with, with him. Uh, uh, I said, yeah, I'm not, like, I'm not really looking to be a manager, but, but it's something that needs to happen. And he said, oh, actually I'm interested in, in being a manager. Um, and he was at my same level, so I went back to him. Was like, he wants to be a manager. Like, why don't you make him? Uh, like, he can get that experience that, that he's actually after. Um, and you know, like, if if you really want me to do it, I'll do it. But I think he'd he'd also be fine. Like, he's very 
compassionate. He knows his uh, technical chops and all that. And so he became the manager. <laughs> so that's how I, I got out of that one. Um, I, I feel for a while when I was in ads, um, I did want to be a manager. And the reason I wanted to be a manager was because I felt that's how you got promoted or mm -hmm. Um, that was a sign that you were kind of going up the ladder. Um, and then, I don't know, at some point I realized that's not the right reason to be a manager. Um, I think the, the manager is really uh, there to serve the reports in a sense. Um, and so thinking about what it means to serve reports, it means being there for them and um, helping them grow in their careers. Um, and something that I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with is power imbalances. Mm -hmm. And I feel that as much as you can be compassionate and, and friendly and, and really trying to help, there is a little bit of a power imbalance if you're someone's manager, regardless of, of how well you get along. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, the people I've mentored throughout the years, um, a lot of them, you know, uh, really open up to me and and have said things to me and have reached out to me with with things that i don't know if they would have done the same thing were either manager because of that that power imbalance so in a sense that's also one of the reasons why i sort of shied away from from being a manager um all that being said um like if i really sense that it's a necessary thing for for to for the team itself to grow uh, I'm willing to do it, but um, you're willing I don't want to be dragged it. into it. <laughs> well, so I, don't want, I don't want to do it for my own career or anything like that. But, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's fascinating as a, a you know, a kind of a cheeky aside because I think you would be. I think we need so the best managers are typically also sometimes the most reluctant ones, <laughs> the people who don't necessarily you know are not doing it for the prestige but are doing it because they are very good at being there and supporting people. So um, that's my cheeky aside. <laughs> I'm part of that cohort that still wants to get Pablo to to at some point progress. But um, I want to do a few quick five questions now, and then I want to open it up because we have a lot of questions coming in. So definitely, if you're in the audience, feel free to throw questions in to the Q and A. Um, so a few quick fire questions. How should someone weigh be between deciding research in an industry setting and a pre purely academic setting? Um, look at your opportunities. I'd say consider both, uh, apply to both, um, and uh, try to get a sense as much as you can as if it's an academic setting, who will be supervising you or, or what the, the other academics in that space uh, have to say and in the industry as well, if, if you can get a sense for what you'll be working on and, and who you'll be working with. Um, I think right now that our field is, is fortunate in that we have this very hybrid approach. So there's good opportunities on, on both ends and there's hybrid opportunities. So there's lots of people that have one foot in industry and are still uh, you know, profs in academia. So I think keep your options open. Yeah, um, I agree. I feel like it always starts with what's your actual opportunity cost. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's imagine that research is a game of Jeopardy and you have to call a friend to help you answer a challenging research question. Who would you call? <laughs> I guess it depends what field it's in. Um, so, uh, and, and what type of, yeah, that's a, uh, like, I don't think there'd be one person that it's um because it, it, if it's a very math question so for instance if it's a highly mathematical question i'd call mark roland from okay. um uh if it's for instance something um reinforcement learning uh just general not necessarily still mathematical but maybe not as as deeply uh into the weeds of math uh, probably Mark, Mark Belmar. Um, if it's something outside of reinforcement learning and more like supervised learning, probably Ugo. Ugo yeah. yeah. And these are also just people I feel comfortable with and I've worked with before. Yeah. So, um, um, okay. A hedged answer. I like it. Preserving <laughs> all your caveats. Um, so you're in charge of NeurIPS and you have an unlimited budget. What would you change? Registration costs. Um, for one, 
unlimited budget, probably location. So I try to find somewhere where there's less uh, barriers for, for people with visas and things like that so that more people can participate. Um, and um, maybe that means even co-location, but uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges that come with, with these, like just doing the hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, in-person and, and virtual conferences is, is like basically organizing two conferences. So I can't even imagine multiple locations, uh, physical conferences, but if it's unlimited budget, I think that would be something kind of nice um, because it, one, it allows overcome some of these visa, visa issues, but also um, flights and things like that is, uh, becomes cheaper for, for different people because you, you have closer places to go to. Uh, yeah, that, that was, those would be the first things that come to mind. Um, I'm going to switch to the questions from the q and A. I I was going to ask you if we, if you had to have your budget, what would you cut? But I'll save that in case we have time at the end. <laughs> so, I'll think about uh, it in the background. <laughs> yeah, think of it, marinate on that one. Um, so anonymous attendee, you seem to li live a full life to do meaningful research work and you engage with the community. Do you have any time management tips? Um, again, all my answers are, are very uh, <laughs> hedged, um, but I feel it really depends on how you work. Uh, I know I'm, I'm, I guess, fortunate in that I can uh, context switch really quickly. Um, so for instance, if I have, I, I do a lot of music. If I have two minutes between meetings, I can play like a two minute uh, Bach piece on the piano uh, just to, to practice and then switch back immediately. Um, or I can, you know, uh, fix a, a bug that I have in a code uh, in, in, you know, very quickly and then go back to whatever meeting I had. I know a lot of people aren't like that um, and they, they really need to focus. Um, so I think the, the time management aspect uh, is, is really, it really depends on, on how you're able to work most effectively. Um, my way of working is constantly con uh, context switching. So um, usually working on 10 different things at, at, at once and I have a bunch of tabs open, like probably all of us, um, but, uh, but I'm constantly running in my head the things I'm working on so I don't forget about them. Uh, Pretty disorganized, but I don't know. That seems to work for me. Yeah, this actually gets to the question that Stephanie asked as well. She was asking how to prioritize your own research direction in such a fast-paced environment. And it sounds like you're to you keep your portfolio projects at any one time and you're able to context switch. Um, I'm going to ask this one. So Joao asks, from one to five, where would you say you stand in the theorist, empirist spectrum? So I guess that's getting at where do you, where's progress falling? That's a good question. Um, I think my, my, where I stand on that scale has changed a bit over the, the last few years. Um, and I'm going to sp speak mostly about reinforcement learning right now. Uh, as I said, my PhD was mostly theory. Um, I'd say I'm leaning more towards empiricist right now in reinforcement learning because the types of RL agents that are having um, like impact in the real world and, and are actually being used in the real world, like whether it be playing Go or flying balloons in the stratosphere or used for nuclear fusion, um, these are using deep nets. And the theory we have so far stops at linear approximators. And so you can be motivated by the theory, that, that's fine, but there's inevitably a theory practice gap. And so one of the things I've been really focused on lately is um, what I, I don't call, but I'm, I'm using the term from physics, exper experimental science. In physics, you have theoretical physics and experimental physics. And the experimental physics is really uh, designing carefully designing experiments to try to understand some of the nature's phenomena that we don't have theory yet for. And, I, and I'm approaching deep RL in, in the similar way, because I feel there's a lot of things we don't, and I think this applies in general for, for deep learning. Um, there's a lot of things we don't quite understand. Um, and so, you know, you have theorems for even for nonlinear function approximators, but typically they say, if you assume an infinite uh, with a uh, neural net or if, uh, it just has two layers. So there, there's assumptions that aren't what are used in practice. And so I think for to 
to have sort of uh, science that informs what we end up using in practice, uh, I'm leaning more towards the empiricist side of things for now. Yeah, that was a good answer. Um, I have a question actually from an anonymous attendee. How do you choose what to work on? Personally, I find topics which I find topics which I found interesting last year don't feel the same now. <laughs> okay, so the anonymous attendee is talking about the pace of change not fields. So how to navigate across different subfields in general? It's a challenging problem, especially if you're just starting because everything seems to be moving so quickly. Um, I think like if, if you haven't found a field where you're really focused on, and this is what I was doing at, at when I rejoined research, just dabble somewhat shallowly in, in, in a few different things um, with the uh, acceptance that you likely won't be published if that's your goal for, for a little while. And that's fine, like you're exploring, like there's no, it's not a race necessarily to you know, increase your, your age index. Um, unless you're trying to graduate. And if, if you're trying to, if you're in your PhD and trying to graduate, then reach out to your supervisor and try to uh, get them to help you focus. And one of the things that's effective to do that is to try to limit yourself to things, topics that your supervisor knows a lot about, because I think that's more effective than going somewhere else where your supervisor won't be able to provide as much guidance. But otherwise, I'd say dabble a little bit here and there um, and really just follow your curiosity. Uh, some of the papers, uh, that I'm on have really been outcomes of just kind of playing around with things. Um, and you occasionally stumble on, on I, either ideas for improving algorithms or weird things that uh, it's like, why is this happening? Um, and, and so you start digging in more and start designing more experiments and, and trying to figure out, or maybe you can try to prove something mathematically. Um, and when you start doing that, then you realize, you start understanding the literature a lot more and you can see, okay, there's a space here for me. Um, you know, you also have to weigh this if, if the thing that really excites you is generative models and generative images. It's a harder space to be in just because right now it's moved. There's so many players in there. So um, if you're like an independent researcher, it might not be the best choice right now just because uh, it, it's a really hot space that's moving very, very quickly and, and requires a lot of compute and, and there's big teams working on that. So um, it, it's fun, but uh, maybe, you know, Keep that in, in your back burner and, and try to see another space that isn't as crowded. Yeah, it, so I always see this arc. It's really interesting you're talking about this, this arc where when the first iteration cycle with a paper is actually the hardest. And then after that, you accrue in the process of just executing on an idea, you accrue a lot of secondary questions. And there's almost this transition point that you observe where someone goes from not knowing what's an interesting question to almost having too many questions, like three, you know, I think it's yeah. typically like three, four papers in, you see someone then having too many questions they want to answer. And it's, it comes through this, uh, what you're describing of, you'll observe things as you get through that first iteration cycle that will lead to why is this happening? What can I work on there? Um, Absolutely. Um, and just one thing I want to say on that front is, um, the, where you mentioned that you have too many ideas. So a lot of us uh, don't have the time to, to explore all these ideas. So things like MLC that, that organizes these uh, uh, um, RFPs, the request for plots, where people will, will pitch an idea. That's a fantastic way to start exploring different areas where you can join a project that um, is somewhat fleshed out, at least uh, the, the, the main structure, and you can play around a little bit um, and get a, some sense for, for that field. Yeah, I uh, I completely agree. I think opting into someone's existing proposal scope is a great step as a first researcher because you get the full arc and it's probably mm -hmm. more de-risk than trying to establish it on your own. So Neil says, PhDs are a major time and monetary commitment. Do you ever feel like the industry is open to promoting people who have undergrad masters and sought out as research engineers to positions of research scientists? So I think Neil is asking about Maybe the change that you you made, so you started, but you did have a PhD. Um, how would you speak to the feasibility of that in today's landscape? So from moving from software engineer to research scientist? Is that so question? from research engineer to positions of research scientist. So I'm still a software engineer. I'm not a research scientist. Um, so that's one way to answer your question. You don't need to switch. Um, of course, it depends where you're working on. So uh, where I am in Google Brain, I think they're very open to 
um, or, or the, the distinction between software engineer and research scientist is, is quite a spectrum. And so you have, I think my day-to-day -day is more like a research scientist, even though my title is software engineer. And there's some research scientists whose day-to-day -day is more like a software engineer. Um, and I think the, the in brain, it's really you're evaluated ideally more on, on how you're contributing to science. Obviously, this is not the case in every uh, scenario. Um, but what I'd say is uh, there are opportunities, even if you're uh, just a very keen undergrad, um, you don't have a master's or, or a PhD perhaps, but if you're very focused, you're very hardworking, um, opportunities will come and people will, will start to recognize uh, your, your qualities and will invite you to projects, even if you don't have that, that research scientist title, which really, I mean, uh, is not that big a deal. If you're doing the, the research that you like and people start uh, giving you uh, confidence to do that and, and sort of trusting you to uh, to ideally eventually lead some of these projects, I think you'll start to show um, what you're capable of. And, and that might result in, you know, doing a PhD eventually, if that's what you want, or or not, or just staying as a software engineer, but um, or research engineer, but maybe you start leading projects and, and leading uh, uh, research directions. Yeah, so we have three minutes le left. I kind of want to end on this really nice question by Aditya. So Aditya asks, being an ML researcher and a jazz musician, what is your perspective on the connections between these fields? Does music help you in your research? There is this fascinating study about, uh, I guess, uh, so-called you, you know, leading researchers uh, over the years. And many, many leading researchers, by whatever dimension you call it, have also had musical talents of played in musical instrument. What do you think about <laughs> that particular theory? <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, I, there is definitely, uh, there, there's been lots of people throughout history that, that are both scientists and, and musicians. Um, I, I mean, I, I think any activity that, that exercises your brain in different ways is useful for, for the research we do. Um, but also on a, on a personal level, I, I love improvising. Uh, like I'm a jazz musician, so I do a lot of improvisation. And I think that's carried over to, to lots of things. So when I give talks, I almost never prepare talks. Like I'll, I'll obviously prepare the slides, but I always kind of improvise the talk when I give it. Um, and it's like, it, there's a sense of, of nerves that when, when you do that, because you don't, <laughs> you don't know if you'll be able to flip, fit within the timeline. But I think that uh, ability to improvise um, is, is likely uh, helped by, uh, you know, my improvisation in piano because you have to, you, you're sort of training your brain to think on the spot. Um, and I think also just the, the more you do music, the more you have to think critically about, you know, when you're pl playing classical music, you don't improvise there, but, um, but you still have to think critically about um, what lines to, to highlight, uh, to, to make the piece come out, how to, uh, the dynamics you use and, and, it's not just, you know, it's not just a MIDI piece that you put into a software and it, and it plays the piano. Like you have to um, sort of make these judgments and almost orchestrate your, your different fingers in the piano or in guitar or whatever, and how you um, deliver this, this thing that's been written. And I think that critical um, uh, self-criticism of, of your performance or of what you do is, is very useful also in research because you, you do have to be self-critical and you, you have to make that call. Like, is this paper ready to be sent out? Or is this idea worth uh, pitching to other people? Um, and so I think, yeah, there's definitely lots of connections there that, that are probably way vaster and, and more uh, nuanced than, than what I just said here. Um, but the more, uh, again, the more you, you do um, many things that exercise your, your mind and, and your spirit, um, I think will eventually be useful. Yeah, there is something about tactile switching that can be really, I find it helps me reset with, with thinking about ideas. So, I mean, I'm no musician, <laughs> but I did, I did start painting a few years ago and I just felt like it exercised a different part of my, uh, my brain and it almost offers you this nice reset. Like I find when I come back to a problem mm -hmm. afterwards, there's a certain reset in clarity and thinking through. Um, this was yeah, a, a exceptional talk. I feel like we covered a, a lot, but I'm just so grateful. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation and coming to the talk. 
because it's really, I, I personally look up to you on so many different aspects. I feel like your values as well as the way in which you do research. So it's so meaningful for me to be able to share this and like do this discussion with you. So thank you so much, Pablo, really. Oh, likely, Sarah. It, this was such a pleasure. Uh, and thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, and thanks to everyone who attended. Uh, so I think we're going to stop the recording now, but uh, really appreciate it. and really appreciate all the questions. So thanks again, Pablo. No, thank you. Oh,